but unique part of the conference. This is the round table on Marx scholarship in the world today. We are thankful to our moderator, Professor Marcelo Musto, for getting the participants together and organizing this round table. Can I request our moderator to please come on stage? Dr. Michael Bree, Professor Kohei Saito, Professor Peter Hudis, Professor Elvira Conchiero, Dr. Paula Rahala, Professor Peter Belhars, and Professor Mikhail Pavlov. I now request our moderator to please take over the proceedings. Thank you. Welcome to this session. <clears throat> the session is entitled Marx Scholarship in the World Today. And uh, as the ceremony wants, I'm opening this book, which was just published a few days ago by Akar Book. This is the Indian edition. And uh, thanks. The title of the book is Marx for Today. <clears throat> Uh, was released a few days ago. The second part, thank you very much. The second part of this book, um, after a first part um, that is called Rereading Marx in 2010, the day of uh, the year of publication of this volume, the second part is entitled Marx Global Reception Today. And uh, it's a sort of uh, first part of the work that we have been doing today and that I've been coordinating in the past years with many colleagues all over the world, which means trying to present a map of the research on Marx today. What is read about Marx today? What are the differences in the countries of the world, in the different regions? When and why Marx started to be read again after 2008 for questions of interpretation after the crisis, for political reasons, because Marx is demanded again. This is also one of the uh, goal of our session today. My colleagues and friends will be very, very good with me today, because as you know, we have the very complicated task of uh, giving back, uh, closing the session at 8.05. We have five minutes late because we started at 7.05, which means that we will be talking six, six to seven minutes each, and this will give us the possibility to have an extra 10 minutes in case there will be three, four lucky colleagues from the audience who will be running and asking the first question. In this case, we will try to elect one representative or two from the table, and they will try to give a very short and superficial, perhaps, answer to you. But we have a dinner coming in one hour, and we will have plenty of time and to discuss all the questions that we will have during the dinner. So, you already have the program, and in order to save time, I'm not telling you where are the scholars from. You can see their CV and bio in the program. But I will tell you that I will follow the order that we have here in the program. 
Michael Briefers, Koei Saito after, Peter Huris, Elvira Conceiro, Paula Rauhala, Peter Beilharz, and then in the end, Mikhail Yul Pavlov. All right? So, Mikhail, you start, seven minutes for you. Thanks. Up to seven minutes. Yeah, Marcello put in a very rigorous, I would say, Prussian way on a, a, a very difficult task on us and three questions he put to us. So I should compress it in five to seven minutes and as a dutiful German, I will try to comply. First question was post-2008 scholarships. I want to mention four achievements, I would say. The first achievement was a publication of the German ideology, Deutsche Ideologie, in the MEGA, in the Marx, Engels uh, um, complete edition this year. What I just want to mention is that um, uh, the, there was somehow the idea that Marx and Engels never wrote such a book like the German ideology. Even today I heard about this. I totally disagree with this. Reading the mega and the new book and I even disagree with those who have edited the, the, the Deutsche Ideologie, the German ideology, because now we can clearly see how Marx and Engels in uh, two years work have step by step developed what we are later called um, materialist understanding of history. Step by step, so I think we are now very clear how far they have proceeded in these years. The second contribution is a very unique one because after Engels, nobody else than Thomas Kuczynski, an outstanding German Marxist, tried to edit the first volume of the Capital in a totally new way. He tried to do it firstly only in German language, without any footnotes, and he tried to bring what is especially important, all the achievements of the manuscripts and especially the French edition into it. So I, we will see it's a controversy if it works, but nevertheless, this is a challenge. Uh, I, uh, I think we should study if he was more able than Engels to bring Marx a real original um, uh, idea into uh, the world. The third uh, contribution I would like is um, Wolfgang Streeck who was a, let's say, social democratic, uh, moderate, neo-institutional theorist. And he, after the crisis brought, uh, created a kind of symbiosis of neo-institutional theory, Schumpeter and Marxism, and brought by this back Marx into the mainstream. This is an achievement. I do not agree with his ideas because they are strategically blind, but nevertheless, I think it's important. And um, uh, last but not least, in your book, Marcello, you are writing, despite, as a new book, um, the, another Marx, despite the many contributions made during decades of scholarship to date, a complete intellectual biography of Marx still has to be written. Of course, I know you are on the way of it, but there is a, um, a person competing with you, it's Michael Heinrich. And there's a first volume of a new biography, a very extended first volume. It will be, I think, five to seven volumes uh, which goes on like this. It's until 1841, only the first volume, but I think it's important. So, what the second question you posed, what are the main topics? I would say, at least for Germany, there is no clear focus on the work of Marx. I can't see any. There is uh, ecological, there are economic problems, social philosophy, and so on. I want to mention something I'm missing in the discussion in Germany, but not only in Germany. The political Marx is missing, I would say. And this is crazy because uh, Marx was uh, political by his bones, by his very heart. Yeah? So <laughs> I'm, I, I think this is... Um, um, uh, a terrible problem because without uh, understanding how politics and philosophy, economy and, and, and in Marx are really connected, we can't deal, uh, can't bring Marx into life in the 21st century. It's totally impossible. So, 
the third problem, how was Marx bicentenary celebrated? The first, uh, I would like just to mention two events to be in time. The first was a movie by a, and this is interesting, by a Haitian filmmaker. A Haitian filmmaker made a German movie on the young Karl Marx. Yeah, he brought back the young guys, Marx and Engels, into our, our cinemas and all over Germany you could see uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, everywhere advertisement seeing these young, uh, young two guys um, and understanding they were, uh, they were on the way to change the world. Um, and it's very nice, a lot of young people went there. The second is, for the first time, at least in the history of federal Germany, and let's say, of, uh, of course, there was no anything like this before in, um, in Western Germany or in the Weimar Republic, uh, there was almost a state celebration of the birthday of Karl Marx. The federal president of our republic, Steinmeier, invited people to celebrate in his palace this birthday. Yeah? And um, um, if you are looking all over the TV, radio, and so on, and in Trier, everywhere, uh, Marx was celebrated. So this is also a new event. Marx, at least now, is a recognized state heritage, state, heritage, uh, state recognized um, intellectual of our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Mikkel. He introduced um, some important topics, the MEGA, obviously the new edition of Marx Engels' writings, new studies and interpretations, the biography very important, and he was also very sharp in highlighting the lack, the missing of political reading of Marx. I might also say that um, today we have a very negative situation in Germany because of the um, very low presence of uh, university professors, professors in German university who are involved in the research of Marx, but we will be talking about this. Now I wanted to do the first coup de théâtre of the session because everybody is expecting that I will give the word to Elvira Concheiro since there is Germany-Mexico today, but in order to avoid problems, the World Cup, the game is later, so we will give the word first to Kuei Japan, and uh, only later we will have uh, other speakers. Kuei, you prefer the microphone or the podium for you? Seven minutes, thanks. Okay, so the German colleague was punctual, so I think Japanese people should be also punctual, so let's try. <laughs> so the Japan is a very unique capitalist country where the Marxism was very, very strong in academia. And, uh, you know, usually, not just in the economics, but also in philosophy, history, more than half of the faculty in the econ department was often Marxist. So that's very unique in the uh, history of Japanese Marxism in comparison to other countries. But the problem is that after the economic crisis of 2008, you know, the Japan was also severely affected by the crisis, but we don't really see any Marxist analysis on that crisis, or we don't really see any like, revival of Marxism, Marxist influence. So I'm trying to discuss why this is happening. And the main problem is that we don't have much like, active uh, younger generation of Marxist scholars who are usually like age of 40s, so that they should write more books, but then we don't ha have many of those people. So let's take a look at the demography a little bit. And uh, in Japan, the first baby boom came after the World War II. So like between 1947 and 1949, we, we had a first baby boom. And then these people, when they graduated from the graduate school, they relatively easily got the job at the university position because that, uh, you know, the half of the econ department was occupied by Marxists. So they very easily got the job. And the problem is that they are now retiring as they got old. So you see that the people around the age of 65 and 70 are very high. And then they're gone between like 2012 and then 2019 because the retire age in Japan is usually 65 to 70 at the universities. But the problem is that the no replacement of the position is taking place. Like, so these people, when these people are gone, these positions also disappear with them. 
So the, for example, at the University of Tokyo, where Unoism was very, the Uno school was very predominant and very well known. The last Unoist professor at the econ department retired two years ago, and now we don't have anyone teaching Marxism. And the situation is similar at the University of Kyoto, even though they don't have much connection to Uno school. And uh, Hitotsubashi University, which is also I'm close to, uh, they had like three Marxist professor at the Department of Social Sciences, and then these professors are gone in the last five years, and then no replacement took place. And it's the same at the Department of Econ Economics at the Hitotsubashi University. So, the position is gone, and so we have like a very serious crisis of reproduction because the younger students now have an interest in Marxism after the economic crisis of 2008, but they don't have place to study at the graduate level. And uh, usually, uh, when uh, the students, um, the people, when uh, after the collapse of uh, Soviet Union, they chose to study postmodern like Foucault or Derrida and Deleuze. So there, there are many active discussions going on, but the Marxism is declining very rapidly. But still, we have some uh, special issues on popular magazines. Uh, the one is last year uh, organized by Ryuji Sasaki, the professor at the Rikkyo University. Uh, that was uh, on the magazine called Gendai Shiso, the contemporary thought, celebrating the 150th year of uh, Das Kapital. And the other one, which just came out last month, is edited by Naoki Yoshihara. He is a professor at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, he uh, published this special issue in the magazine called Economic Seminar. And it really covers a wide range of authors. But then, just two. I think that, you know, yesterday, Professor Ghosh said 50 years ago, there are so many conferences and a magazine focusing on Marx 50 years ago. It was very similar in Japan. There were very active discussions. But this, on the last year, there are very special years of Marxism. We only have these, like, two uh, uh, special issues. Of course, we had like, other minor ones, but then the big ones are only these two. And then we don't have something uh, like the one that we had in Toronto last year, the big conference, it's gathering uh, important scholars all over the world. We don't have something like that even this year. We have small one in Tokyo in December, but uh, nothing comparable like the one in Toronto or the one in Berlin organized by Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. So I have two more minutes and then cover. Still, there are some uh, important books and discussions that I want to sort of uh, introduce. And uh, one is, of course, the possibilities of post-capitalist society uh, after the collapse of state uh, socialism. So some people, like Teinosuke Otani, started looking at the Marx theory of association as an alternative theory uh, to the Soviet model or Chinese model uh, socialism. And then this book is really huge, like 500 pages encompassing the, all the citations of, uh, related to the Marx theory of association. And then the other one is uh, also by Otani Teinosuke because he is involved in the edition of the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, the MEGA, and uh, we have a team of editing the, some volumes in the fourth section of the MEGA. And uh, Teinosuke Otani looked very carefully at the Marx original economic manuscript comparing with Engels' edition of the th third volume of Capital, showing how the Engels' edition makes the Marx original intention uh, very obscure and hard to rediscover. So there are many misunderstandings based on uh, Engels' edition, and that's what he shows in, the, in terms of the theory of interest being capital. And if I may sort of advertise myself, I also take a look at the uh, notebooks by Marx and then take a look at the ecological critique of capitalism. And the UNO school is not uh, extinct yet. And then he's Kei Ehara, he's in my generation, analyzing the theory of crisis from UNO's perspective. And the last one is the foreign rate of profit, uh, as Son Jin Jong yesterday discussed. This is very important also in Japan. And then Ko Kazuo Konishi discusses the foreign rate of profit in Japanese economy. So I'm running out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kuei, for reminding us how important is the tradition of Marxist studies in Japan in political economy and also 
connection with what Mikael Bree said at the beginning, uh, that there are several groups working on MEGA in Japan. They, are, they belong to the old generation of professors, and it is true that uh, um, in Japan there are not so many um, important conferences and events, Capital 150 and Marx 200, uh, which is different with what is going on in the rest of the world, since there are really literally more than hundreds of these events that we are having today in Patna in the world for the entire 2018. So there is a big return. There is a lack of new generation in Japan, but quite we are very, very hopeful in you, since you are now one of the new leading young scholars of Marx in the world and not only in Japan. Peter Houdis, United States of America, North America. Microphone is there. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> there's one thing that, that can be said for sure about the United States, <clears throat> and that's that in the United States, class relations have always been structured and shaped by racial and ethnic determinants. Given that basic reality, <clears throat> it should come as no surprise um, that um, there's a slew of new works that have appeared in the last decade that push back against the notion that Marx's work uh, is reducible to a theory of class struggle, um, and that instead tried to explore Marx's work in light of issues of race and ethnicity. And um, much of this is reflected <clears throat> in a resurgence, in some quarters at least, of interest in Marx's uh, voluminous writings on the U.S. Civil War. A new collection of Marx's writings on the Civil War, which has been out of print for 50 years, has been recently republished. Uh, people may not realize, but there's something like 250 pages that Marx wrote on the subject. But even more so, there is a considerable uh, growth of discussion on the um, Marx's writings in his last decade, end of his life, on non-Western world and his writings on nationality, um, <clears throat> on the peasantry, on communal forms of social organization, in his notebooks on indigenous peoples, the ethnological notebooks, notebooks on Kovalevsky, his notebooks on Indonesian society, and his commentaries, his marginal notes on uh, Australian and South African society, including his short but important notes on Zulu culture and society that he did near the end of his life. Uh, one of the major works that explores this is Kevin Anderson's book, Marx at the Margins, that's opened up a considerable amount of discussion uh, about this dimension of Marx's work, which undermines very seriously the very narrow conception that Marx developed some kind of universal theory of history. Marx made it very clear, as Anderson argues, that the delineation of the historical tendency of capitalist accumulation and das Kapital, Marx argued, what, by the 1870s was restricted to West European developments and West European developments alone. There is no unilinear theory of history in Marx because there is no universal theory of history in Marx. Marx was trying to learn new things about the non-Western world and he spent much of the last decade of his life doing that. David Norman Smith is going to be completing very shortly, I expect, a of the first English translation of Marx's ethnological notebooks that we hope to be uh, published rather soon. So that's one uh, thing that's going on. Secondly, and not unrelatedly, um, is the question of Marx and gender. Um, there's a long history of Marxism and feminism, of course, and efforts to connect or relate or debate the relationship between Marxism and feminism. But many people have tended to look to Engels or to Babel as the source for this sort of material without looking directly into Marx's writings, or at least comprehensively trying to put the pieces together. I should mention, by the way, just in passing, for those of you who are still enamored of Babel, do not forget what he called Rosa Luxemburg, that poisonous bitch. I'm sorry to have to quote it, but uh, he was certainly not somebody we should be taking as a model for socialist feminism in the 21st century. Um, there is a very fascinating book, though, pushing in a very different direction by Heather Brown, called um, Marx on Gender, Woman, and the Family. That's a comprehensive study of Marx's writings on women from his 1844 manuscripts where Marx actually declared, wrote in his critique of Volker Communism, that it's the man-woman relationship which is the most fundamental in society. I really wish that more Marxists had paid attention to this statement. Uh, she also goes into uh, Marx's writings on women and capital and also goes into the ethnological notebooks, especially Marx's commentary about how societies uh, such as in Ireland, pre-capitalist Ireland, gender relations were far more equal and more advanced than in Western society. It makes the same point about Native American cultures in North America. 
There's a third area as well, um, however, and that is a slew of books actually in the last five or six years on Marx's value theory and the logic of capital. And there's actually too many of them uh, to list in five minutes, but I'll just say the general notion, the general thrust of many of these works is to push back against the notion that Marx's critique of capital is centered on a critique of the existence of private property and the market. Those, of course, were phenomena that Marx critiqued, but they are only phenomenal expressions of the logic of capital. You can abolish both and not abolish the logic of capital. So there's a very uh, a number of studies that have tried to go deeper into the pure logic of capital, into value theory, of mediate, value theory itself, the value form of mediation, to try to draw out a much uh, deeper uh, understanding of the radical nature of Marx's critique of a society uh, governed by value production. Some of the works on this, by the way, include David Harvey's book, Marx, Capital, and the Madness of Economic Reason. Tony Smith has a new book out, about a year or two old, Marx's Capital and Hegel's Logic. Frederick Jameson, his work, Representing Capital, a reading of volume one. But I would especially recommend people to take a look at Fred Mosley's new book on money and totality, which represents one of the most comprehensive efforts to develop a macro monetary interpretation of Marx's capital. This is getting considerable discussion alongside uh, the new English translation of Marx's original manuscript of volume three of Capital. Uh, Fred also wrote the introduction to that. Now, uh, lastly, or kind of lastly, uh, the Cana my Canadian friends will be very upset at me if I claim uh, their country for the United States. Uh, a matter of fact, it's usually the opposite. When I go overseas nowadays, since Trump's election, very often I'll try to uh, pretend to be Canadian. Um, but in any case, <laughs> um, there was a very important conference about uh, six weeks ago in Montreal. Uh, again, that's not the US, but out of a thousand people at this conference, roughly half of them were from the United States, or quite a few hundred came from the United States. The conference was entitled The Grand Transition to Post-Capitalist Society. There's a lot of interest in, as uh, uh, Kohei just mentioned about Japan, um, in what Marx's work has to suggest about the content of the post-capitalist society. There was a couple of dozen panels and discussion sessions that were dealing in different aspects or touching on this er er issue of transition to socialism or trying to redefine an understanding of socialism given the tragedies of the 20th century. A number of books have also appeared on this in the last couple of years, or at least the last decade. My own work on Marx's ca concept of the alternative to capitalism. And also Kieran Allen has a book that came out not long ago called Marx and the Alternative to Capital Capitalism. So I expect that discussion as well to continue. Lastly, I'm very interested in what the, Mikhail said about the lack of works on Marx's political theory. There are two important works on Marx's political theory, very refreshing analysis. August Nimitz has written a book on Marx and the Democratic Opening, trying to argue that Marx was a fundamental inspiration on democratic movements and that revolutionary democracy is integral to Marx's critique of capital. And more recently, William Clare Robinson has written a fascinating book. Uh, I don't endorse all of his claims in it, but he's a very fascinating book, uh, Marx's Inferno, uh, taking a look, re-examining Marx as a political theorist and drawing an analogy between the structure of Marx's capital and Dante's Inferno. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Peter, excellent. Um, so what Peter told us is that after these new editions are published in the mega, then they arrive to universities and there are researchers that are using these new materials of Marx to suggest new possible readings, right? So this is what Peter told us, embarrassing me because you said so many good things, which is the topic of my talk in two minutes and I don't know if I can do it so well as you did about the last Marx about race, ethnicity or about gender. And I will add a third topic, which is Marx and ecology. Just for question of time, you could not do it. And the United States has done a lot from this point of view. So the new manuscript, the new mega are produced and they arrive in the university and people are using these new materials to present a different Marx. Less dogmatic, perhaps quite, this will attract new generation, not only uh, interested in debates on postmodernism, etc. Uh, the next speaker is Elvira Concello. She will be talking about a geographic area. Elvira and Paola, it's not only a country, like Peter also did, North America, geographic area, in this case, is Hispanic America. Thank you very much. Uh, excuse me, my limited uh, English. 
As in the whole world, in Latin America, Marx thought has had a new moment after the crisis of 2008. More texts have been circulated, and a good number of debates are taking place without beginning to have some repercussions which practically didn't happen in previous years. Such is in the case of the relevant seminars organized by the government of Bolivia, and specifically by the vice presidency headed by Alvaro Garcia Linera, who has been a prominent promoter of the reactivation of the Marxist studies and debate of the region. And also, it has promoted intense exchange with some important Marxists from different parts of the world. The development of this process is, of course, very uneven. The countries of which there have been in progress social policies are those that have led with greater possibilities. The production of works that are undoubtedly inserted in the perspective of the thinking of Marx and that by practical necessity incorporate new views. In that sense, we can say this is Latin America, we have a fertile file for new productions. In that direction, we can mention what has been published an award of years in Venezuela, which has promoted works Latin America with the Libertadores Prize. But something similar happened in Brazil, Argentina, and Ecuador, where now the unfavorable political change for the left of those countries still demand the continuation of the wave of debates and publication. Only in Brazil has then been an important project of translation of Marx's works of the world and some of the works that Mega 2 have made no science, Argentina and Mexico, which before the crisis of the end of the last century were the place of publication, the most of Marxist publication, especially Argentina became real power in that field, had not reached their old standards. Only in Bolivia, from my perspective, this process has greater continuity and consistency because the small and poor country of the region has had surely in correspondence with an intense political process, nuclei of great the theoretical density, as is the case of the group Comuna and its commun current, sorry, current referrals. In this Bolivian process, I would like to highlight the publication of the complete work of René Zabaleta, one of the most important Latin American Marxists who undoubtedly lives up to Jose Carlos Mariategui, but due to his premature death in Mexico, where Zabaleta lived years of exile, had been very little note and recovered in his country. On the other hand, a group of the colonial studies was formed years ago under the initiative of some Latin American intellectuals inserted in the North American Academy, a group that includes several prominent Marxists, such as the recently deceased Aníbal Quijano of Peru, or Enrique Dussel, an Argentine naturalized Mexican, who has produced a work of the greatest relevance. But what is important, I think, is that in past year we have seen many of the Latin American countries appear to large groups of young scholars who are shaping a new generation of Marxists. For the time being, among these groups of recovery of, sto of a story that was inclusive with the events of 1989, predominated. It's about the recovery of the debate that had led to the changes that had taken place since the Cuban Revolution, the intense armed struggle that has encouraged it, and finally, the Chilean 
experiment of the popular unity hated by Salvador Allende, and that the later military coups tried to extinguish. So that contribution of what was known a theory of dependence with words as relevant as the one made by the Brazilian Marxist Rui Mauro Marini, or the contribution of the so-called Argentinian Gramscians with the enormous editorial work of Jose Arico in his collections of past and present are a matter of deep investigation of these young people. That critical recovery also in Cuba, where a new generation turns to the meaning of the important magazine, Critical Thinking, of the 60s and 70s of the last century, rejects of the Soviet roots Marxism that proliferated in Cuba, and critically questions the work of Che Guevara, among others. But the same at the same time, these young Cuban Marxists are corringing out of the analysis of the new processes of the Iceland. But along with the recovery, there are also new readings, many that are actually under the dominant parameters today. So that in our university, there is a growing number of studies of young researchers who, apart from the concrete study of their realities, carry out of work that we call, can call Marxist search, which is very difficult to have a perspective of the political. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and thanks to Elvira as well. <clears throat> So Elvira told us that um, the Marx that we read today in uh, South America it was not only Hispanic America because you were very good to providing information about Brazil as well, is a very political Marx. When we read these letters that Peter Wood has told us about Vera Zasulic, about the last Marx, they were debated very much and reprinted in thousands of copies in Bolivia. Uh, as you told us, so what is the interpretation that we have? will be debating about these issues in the coming days of the conference? And then Venezuela, the same. There are new Gramsci's to discover or to rediscover in South America. Maria Tegui, Zavaleta, there are new studies, like you mentioned at Dussel or Hannibal Hicano, who dies, unfortunately, a few days ago. So one of the topics, one of the things that we have, and we are working on this also with the series that I coordinate, Marx, Engels, Marxism, is to print, is to translate these new studies into English, to avoid that the Marxist of the next decades will be only a North American or Anglo-centric Marxism, based on uh, uh, studies closed inside university. This marks is much more political. And finally, Elvira also told us about the big missing country of this session, which is Brazil. <clears throat> because I believe that Brazil is the country in the world today where Marx is read most, and by this young generation of uh, very good, brilliant, and political scholars. And now we go from the very warm South America to the cold Nordic country, Scandinavia, in Europe. Paula. Thank you. Uh, common to all Nordic countries uh, is the revival after 2008. So the new generation of uh, students uh, started to, to read Marx. Uh, there is a great generation gap. They got help from the older generation, which read Marx in the 60s and 70s. Uh, so the reality is at the moment that the, the people dealing with Marxist theories are either in their 30s or 40s or, six, or 70s and 80s. Uh, these are the Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Iceland and Denmark, small countries. Uh, in Nor Norway there has been uh, many uh, printings of Capital Volume 1 in the last 10 years. Uh, Capital Volume Two appeared for the first time in uh, Norwegian in 2017. Um, recently, um, no, I should say about English publications. Um, Jürgen Sandemose just published a book in Rutledge call, called Class and Property in Marxist Economic Thought, Explore, Exploring the Basis for Capitalism. It was launched a few days ago. And on the, 
occasion of Marxist Bicentenary, uh, a Marxist journal called KNIST published a special issue. In Sweden, there is a Center for Marxian Social Studies. It has organized, a, uh, to, together with the University of Södertörn and journals Klarte and Fronesis, a Marx conference in 2013 and 2016, and the next one is 2019. Um, interesting contributions in English from Sweden are Sven Erik Liedmann's uh, biography of Marx, um, which appeared in English uh, last year. Uh, its name is uh, World to Win. The original was 2015. Another interesting book is Andreas Malm's uh, Fossil Capital, which won last year the Isaac and Dam Tamara Deutscher Prize. Uh, in Sweden, as elsewhere, uh, capital has interested, especially young people. So Mats Lindberg's introduction to capital was republished in 2013, and one very well-known uh, Swedish uh, Marxist uh, researcher is, of course, uh, Jöran Terborn. In Sweden, the bicentenary of Marx was celebrated with uh, seminars, uh, screening of the young Karl Marx, movie and theater performance in Stockholm. In Finland, Karl Marx Society has organized a summer school since 2012. Our idea is to discuss the papers of the students. Uh, the reason is that in very few university departments there, there is any expertise on Marx or, or Marxism, and that's why our summer school has been of a great help for, for students doing their bachelor's thesis or master's thesis or PhD uh, thesis. Most of the few existing Finnish Marxists um, participate um, or cooperate with the Historical Critical Dictionary of Marxism, which is an ambitious German-based international project. Another direction of cooperation is Russia. Uh, Professor Vesa Oittinen has published, uh, edited a few volumes and organized uh, seminars on creative Soviet philosophy especially on Ewald Ilyenkov's thinking. And one book worth mentioning is uh, a uh, book by Mikko Lahtinen on Louis Althusser. And all of these books have appeared in historical materialism book series. We celebrated Marx's bicentenary at the University of Tampere with a few events, with altogether 250 uh, participants. And there will be also other seminars in other universities. About Iceland, I cannot say much, but there is a Karl Marx Society, which is impressive for a country with some 200,000 uh, inhabitants. But those who watched television yesterday know that Iceland can do uh, also other impressive things. Um, Otto Masson, who has written about Marx, has been present in in media in Iceland on the occasion of Marxist bicentenary, here pictures of a journal article and a radio interview. In Denmark, a Society for Marxian Social Studies was uh, founded a few years ago. They organize a yearly conference uh, on Marx. And it seems to me that uh, in Denmark, um, the number of young researchers is, is pretty impressive. So the number of PhD students and postdocs uh, gives a lot of hope for the future. Uh, on the occasion of... Um, no, first uh, I should mention Gerd Kallesen, who's um, a researcher of older generation, who has been editing, co-editing um, Engels' letters to MEGA. And then on the occasion of Marx's bicentenary, um, a journal on history of ideas called Slagmark published a special issue on Marx. To conclude about Nordic countries, um, 2008 is clearly a, a break. New generation is uh, especially interested in capital. And uh, I also think that they are very rarely economists. There are institutional reasons. And, and they have rarely studied economics, and you all know why this is the case. And another popular topic is Marx and ecology. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Paolo, for being so brave and presenting all these countries and so well in a few minutes. So, uh, in relation to what Mikael Blee told us, there are new biographies, new studies, and one of them came from Sweden, 2015. It was the biography that Verso decided to translate in English and publish for the anniversary, for the 200 anniversaries. And Paola also told us about what do you do in dark times where there are no courses on Marx in the universities, how do you work and resist with the young generation, etc. You do organize societies. In every country, I go there often, there are Karl Marx societies and they were, played a very good role in keeping the battle of the ideas until 2008 came the crisis and the turning point for new generation to come back. The next scholar is Peter Pilard. Peter, please. What I have to say will disappoint you. Um, I have some notes, but uh, I'm drawing rather in what I want to say on the energy which is being um, shown from the, the podium. So I'll, um, I'll add lib to try and address some of the questions that have been suggested for discussion. Uh, the reason, I guess primarily for the disappointment that I may convey is that while there are many long and rich traditions connected with Marxism in Australia, uh, the situation with reference to Marx scholarship, especially with the period that's being privileged here, the last decade or so, uh, is weak. Uh, it seems to me on the basis of uh, uh, conversations, some assistance from Sean Supsky, uh, Shannon Brinkat, to be reasonable to say that there's no strong Marx philology at the moment in Australia. Uh, I'm struck by the uh, stories that are being told here and the extent to which uh, while a good deal of our discussion hitherto has concerned international flows, cultural traffic, the transmission of ideas from place to place, we're also obliged here to talk about national traditions. And I think the fact of the matter in Australia is that the national tradition of radicalism has been dominated for a hundred years by laborism, uh, as in Britain, but with its own peculiarities. Uh, Australia, in fact, New Zealand before Australia, pioneered the shift towards new laborism and this involved, among other things, the collapse of the Communist Party, uh, the liquidation of the Communist Party in Victoria into the centre-right of the Labour Party in 1984, well before the other major changes that came upon us. What we now uh, encounter as radicalism in Australia, I think, is a kind of residual left populism, which is uh, constructed against the dominant neoliberal populism. There are, of course, uh, younger people who are engaged in social movement politics and in the life of the sects, which have been a part of uh, Australian history alongside the labor movement, the social movements, and political parties. But I'm struck also by um, what our Japanese friend has referred to as a, a demographic transition. This is absolutely the case in Australia. And perhaps what's more overpowering is a kind of transformation of the universities, uh, commercialization of the universities, which has meant that universities are simply no longer capable of generating the kind of public space either for the teaching of radical thinking, including Marxism, or for the kind of civic activity which has been associated with universities for such a long time, clubs, associations, demonstrations, so on and so forth. Universities in Australia have been transformed by the Labor government initially uh, into uh, institutions which simply do not sustain the kind of critical culture which we'd associate with the life of the mind, the notion of Bildung, the sense of critique, and so on and so forth. Um, 
I'm associated with. I, I founded uh, a journal called Thesis 11 in, in 1980, nearly 40 years ago. It certainly made some contribution to Mark's scholarship, probably in its earlier years especially. Uh, we were the, the first, I think, uh, journal in English to publish uh, Hans Georg Backhaus. Uh, we published the views of the, uh, of the Budapest School, who arrived in Australia in 77, uh, 78. We had close affiliations with those students of Lukács, the most important of whom, in terms of Marx scholarship, is celebrated uh, tomorrow or the day after in the lecture that's dedicated to the memory of Georgi Markush. Uh, there are now three generations, uh, but in decline. I'm afraid I'm, I'm, I'm painting a picture of decline here. There are three generations that emerge from uh, the Budapest School in Australia. There are other very significant trends associated, especially with the work of Gramsci, uh, the work of Alastair Davidson, my teacher, uh, Peter Thomas, and others. But what I do not see, what I cannot find in Australia at the moment, is anything like these signs of boom, a Marx boom, a, a substantial development in uh, publications, uh, in enthusiasm for, for Marx. Uh, intellectually or politically. The question that concerns me then is who now teaches Marx? Because uh, in Australia, to the very best of my knowledge, especially in my field, sociology, Marx is not taught philologically. Marx is not taught textually at all. The work may make a, a, a tokenistic presence in some register or another, but the idea of reading Marx verse and line is something which my generation had ready access to and is now gone. So the most serious question that presents itself to me uh, in Australia isn't about the intellectual survival of, of Marxism. That's, I think, uh, okay. Uh, we do our best to keep that moving. But after the identification of Marxism in the universities in the 80s and the current transformation and commercialization of universities, if Marx is no longer communicated in civil society, oh, I'm sorry, if Marx is no longer taught in civil society, as his work was for the first two thirds of the 20th century, as an alternative knowledge, who now teaches or learns Marx? I've been suggesting that there are some lineages, there's some journals, uh, there are some significant individuals, but there's no critical, significant mass that I can see. There are individuals and their students. Um, there are some interesting openings for us, for example, in collaborations with our uh, colleagues and comrades in Chengdu, in Sichuan, in the Marxist Bibliography Project. So we are still, I think, at the moment, circling Marx. The best I can hope for is the best is yet to come. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks to you, Peter. What you told us about the university and the lack of philology is a problem that we encounter in many countries. If you do a statistic research, Michael, of what is read today in the discipline of sociology in the university, you will find that uh, some parts of the German ideology, the division of labor, are the parts most read. Obviously, there is a debate that this text existed, but one other thing is to use that as the final uh, elaboration of Marx. And the same in political theory. I found that in many universities, when they read Marx and political theory, to come back to another topic, they read on the Jewish question, which is something that Marx wrote before having the beard. And by the way, in a language, English, where the Jewish question of Bruno Bauer has never been translated. Huh? So they don't understand about the debate. Another important thing is this relevance of the philosophical early writings that are very limited compared to the richness of the last 25 years in political economy and in political theory. Peter also told us about this weakness of the Marxist tradition, which is another phenomenon that we encountered in very many countries and geographic areas of the world, and the fact that there was no Marx boom after 2008, which is the case in some other parts of the world. I guess that this is also what we have in Eastern Europe and in Russia, but I will let Michael, you, Pavlov, speak about this in maximum seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, you know that uh, in Soviet Union, Marxism was. Uh, you know that uh, in the Soviet Union, Marxism was official ideology, but uh, in early 90s, about 90% uh, of Marxist, so-called Marxist in Soviet Union, reverted, betrayed their beliefs. And uh, now we have many dogmatic Marxists, mostly Stalinists, and uh, many sometimes strange people who want to develop Marxism in very different uh, ways, sometimes uh, unusual ways, uh, combining it with economics mostly. They have uh, no own opinion and uh, they want to combine different theories. Uh, but we have also very well organized post-Soviet school of critical Marxism and I represent uh, this school. Alexander Busgalin, leader of this school. Uh, it is a school on post-Soviet space, so it is post-Soviet and uh, critical opposed to former official dogmatic version of Marxism. Uh, we have many tens of very active scientists, uh, mostly professors, who wrote uh, <coughs> over 50 fundamental books, <coughs> who organize forums, congresses and conferences, over 10 large events every year. Of course, uh, we have celebrated uh, 200 uh, years of Marx, a large uh, forum, and uh, we have published hundreds of articles, many tens of books, uh, conference papers. Uh, we have also used University of Modern Socialism open for everyone, mostly for use, but in very wide range, uh, who are interested uh, in modern Marxism and uh, socialism in particular. And uh, we actively participated in political movement, in work movement, uh, alter, not uh, anti, but alter globalist movement. We formed some political organizations and so on. But now we concentrated mainly on academic activity, teaching, studying, exploring. Uh, several hundred of papers were presented uh, by our representatives of post-Soviet School of Critical Marxism on international conferences abroad. Uh, we have two journals, alternatives for wide range for wide uh, auditory, from worker activists to professors. And uh, <coughs> this journal, Alternatives, celebrated the <coughs> 25th anniversary recently. And uh, several years ago, <coughs> we established a journal, Questions of Political Economy. It's an academic journal. And uh, Alexander Busgalin and uh, <coughs> partly me organized courses for students on Marxism and Center of Modern Marxian Studies, both in Moscow, in Romanos of Moscow State University, University number one in Russia. So <coughs> I think that uh, we continue such uh, large activity. And uh, <coughs> we see that uh, many people uh, who betrayed uh, Marxism in uh, early 90s now are returning to this, in this point. Thank you. Thanks also to our colleague Pavlov, who told us that despite difficulties, there are also in Russia and in some other countries that belong to the so-called socialist bloc, some uh, small attempt to 
Revitalize, uh, with organization of conferences, of journals, you mentioned alternative, another one is Stasis. And perhaps we can not only use the new writings of Marx, like uh, Brie and Houdet said at the beginning of the session, but also new topics. And one important is the relevance of the individual freedom in the thought of Marx, right? And how it is important for the left, for progressive movement, to reappropriate of this essential category uh, not only theory but for political struggle in Marx. At this point, it's a dramatic moment for a chair. A chair has two options. <laughs> the first option is to open the floor, to disappoint everybody, to make you fight because I am the first, I want to ask this, and then who is responding? The second option is what I'm going to do is to invite you to buy this book, Marx for Today, where you will find more information. Every uh, country and chapter, you will find all the most important books written in the past years. And then to applaud this very good uh, crowd of scholars uh, that is going to take the picture with me in a few seconds and uh, to discuss with them and involve in more um, debate during the dinner. Thank you very much for your attention and thanks to all the speakers for being so good. Thanks. Vamos. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers and our moderator for that very informative and interesting session. I request Dr. Sunita Lal now to present the mementos to our speakers and our moderator. And with that, we come to the end of the second day of the conference. We saw some very compelling lectures, presentation of research papers, and a round table today. Uh, a couple of announcements. I'm going to repeat myself over the next couple of days. Uh, please bear with me. Uh, everyone posting on social media, our hashtags are hashtag marks 200 and hashtag marks for global future. We request all the delegates to please take out five minutes for the video testimonies for Adri's archives. <laughs>